Hello there, I'm Jamie. Welcome to another session of Ist Export Services. In this session, I'll be taking you through the process of creating your studio lighting realistically. This specific studio lighting will be used for a car. However, you can also use the same studio lighting for product design, furniture, etc. So without further ado, let's start by setting up the scene. To start with, click on the Customize Toolbar and choose the Preferences Settings option. Open the Gamma LUT tab. As you can see, the Gamma is already enabled and set to 2.2. If he wasn't, you'd have had to set it up like this. We can also check the General tab, Viewports, and then click OK. The following step is to set up the scene units. To do so, click on the Customize Toolbar and choose the Unit Setup option from the drop down list. As you can see, the display unit scale is set to metric and in meters. It's worth noting, all you see here is for display purposes only. The physical scale of the scene is determined by the system unit setup, which you can click to check. For the purpose of this exercise, the system unit setup is set to one unit to be equal to one centimeter. However, you can change other units display here if you prefer as long as objects in your scene have the correct scale. Once you're happy, click OK to close the dialog. Before we start modeling the base of the scene, we're going to bring in the 3D car, which is a car that's already been modeled. It's a Tesla car. So from that car, we're going to start modeling the base of the studio and go from there. Let's start by clicking on the Max button. Go to the Import and click on the Merge option. In the folder, let's click and merge the file named Car with No Materials. In the Merge dialog, click All and OK to merge all listed objects in the scene. That's the car there. Before we start doing anything in the scene, we need to ensure the scale is correct. To do so, click on the Create panel, Helpers, and click on the Tape tool. As mentioned earlier, the displays in meters, even though the scene is in centimeters. Click and drag up to create the tape tool. As you can see, the length is about 1.4 meters, which is the average height of a car. So the scale of the car is correct. We can now delete the tape tool. The next step is to group the car. To do so, Click Ctrl plus A on your keyboard to select all objects in the scene. With all objects selected, click on Group and select the Group option from the list. In a Group dialog, name it as Car. The entire selection is now grouped. Select the Move tool. As you can see, the pivot point is right in the middle of the car. If you are to scale this model, the scale would start from where the pivot point is, as opposed to the base of the car. When scaling, you need to start from the base of the object, so it doesn't overlap with other objects below. To do so, select on the Hierarchy tab, click on the Pivot button, and on the Effect Pivot only. Next. Click on the Center to Object and on Move Tool. In the viewport, select the Pivot Object and move it to the base of the car. Next, we are going to snap it to the base. To do so, click on the Snaps Toggle Toolbar. Right click on it. The first thing to do is to enable the Vertex option and the End Point. These two options will ensure the snapping will occur on vertices and angle of objects. Go to the Options tab. Make sure the display marker is enabled. Also, the snapped frozen objects, the axis constraints and display rubber band. The Snap to Frozen Objects option is very useful when tracing AutoCAD splines. Users often freeze the CAD files in the viewport but still able to trace over the CAD splines. 
check the other options and close the dialog. As you can see, the snap is set to 2.5, which allows the snapping to occur on 2D views such as front, top and left viewports. To snap, simply move down. As you see the target sign, choose where to snap the pivot to. Before exiting the pivot, click on the Move tool and Rotate and Scale tool. Sometimes the pivot doesn't jump straight away. Give it a few seconds to automatically adjust. As you can see, the moving, rotating and scaling will always start at the base of, of the object. We can now exit the pivot by going to the Create panel. Let's save the max file as Car Studio Lighting. The following step is to create the curvy floor of the studio. It's best to use the left or front viewport to create it. Simply open the create panel. Under splines, click on the rectangle button. The reason why we are choosing the rectangle shape is mainly because it allows users to quickly smooth up the corner radius by increasing the corner radius values. Click and drag to create the rectangle in the viewport. Once created, open the Modify panel. In the corner radius, increase its values until the corners is extremely rounded. If you zoom in closely, you can clearly see the edges are not completely smooth. To, to rectify this, open the interpolation parameters and increase the step values. The interpolation values will not add more vertices to the surface, but will smooth the corners substantially. Next, add an editable spline by typing and finding it in the list. Or by clicking the editable spline button. To create this button, simply click on the configure modifiers button and choose to configure modifier sets. You can set the total buttons here. In this section, you can choose the modifiers you frequently use and drag them into each button. Having these buttons available to click is much quicker than having to constantly finding them in the list every time you need them. The reason for adding the edit spline on top is to be able to move up and down the stack to edit if and when necessary. This option is often better than collapsing the entire stack into editable spline. To add it, click on the vertex selection type or press 1 on your keyboard. Select the top vertices, right click and choose to convert the selected vertices into corner type. Press delete to delete the top two vertices. Select the next two vertices and move them up to extend the studio base. Enable the segment selection type or press 2 from your keyboard. Select those two segments and press delete to delete them. Select that front segment and delete it. Select that vertex and convert it into a corner type. Extend it further to the right so it goes beyond the camera view. Also, select this vertex and extend it a bit. Next, let's select the entire spline by clicking on the spline selection type or by pressing 3 on your keyboard. To give the spline some thickness, go to the outline function and type in minus 100 millimeters. Even though the display units are in meters, by typing in minus 100 mm, 3D Max will know the value you intend to enter. Deselect the edit spline modifier and add the extrude modifier on top of it. Extrude the spline by increasing its amount value. Zoom out and move the surface so you can extrude further and see more of the surface. The following step is to create and set up a physical camera. Before we do that, let's start by bringing in the photo reference first. To do so, click on the rendering tab and choose the view image file option from the drop down menu. 
In the folder, choose this photo reference of a Tesla car photo. This photo reference was found on Pinterest by simply typing in Tesla car studio photography. Before we start with the camera, let's rename the studio floor as base. To create a camera, in a create panel, click on a camera button, followed by clicking on a physical camera type. You can also choose a V-Ray or a standard camera if you prefer. Click and drag it in the top viewport to create the camera and its target. Open the modify panel. Because we'll be moving the camera, let's uncheck the targeted function for the time being. In a perspective viewport, click on a perspective text and choose the view to be camera. The following step is to try to match the camera angle seen in a photo reference. This is one of the many reasons why it's important to use photo references whenever possible. Let's enable the targeted function again and move it slightly. Right click and choose to rotate. Uncheck the targeted function again and rotate the camera. Move it a bit more. After a few tweaks, the final camera angle ended up looking like this. The following step is to ensure the framing of the camera is square, as it's often done with similar studio shots. To do so, open the Render Setup dialog. In a common step, change the width and height output size value to 640 by 640 pixels. Also, lock the image aspect by clicking on its padlock button. The final output value will be later increased before sending the final render. In the viewport, click on the camera text and choose the Show Safe Frames option from the list. This option allows you to see the areas of the viewport that will be rendered. In this specific course, the Vero render engine was automatically loaded in my default settings. However, if you had to load it up, you would do the following. In a common tab, scroll down and expand the sign render rollout. Click on the production toggle and choose the Vero Advanced 3.6 from the list. Back in the camera viewport, we are going to select and extend the studio floor further to the right until the empty space is covered. Let's minimize some of these dialog boxes. First, in the top viewport, select the studio floor and move it to the right slightly. Open the Modify panel. In Extrude Parameters, increase the amount value further and move the studio floor to the right. Repeat the previous actions until everything is framed nicely. Before sending the first test render, we are going to ensure most rendering settings are set to draft for quick test renders. Open the Render Setup dialog and go to the V-Ray tab. In V-Ray, most parameters are collapsed by default. To expand them, click on the default button twice to change it to expert mode. Expert mode displays all hidden parameters of the image sampler. Expand the global DMC parameters rollout. Under progressive image sampler, let's leave the current universal preset as they are. Minimum divisions to 1, max subdivisions to 100, render time in minutes 1, and noise threshold to 0.005. In global DMC parameters, click on the default button once to change it to advance. Check the environment parameters in color mapping. In color mapping type, change it from Reinhardt to exponential and to export mode. Exponential color mapping type is quite useful to balance out all the bright areas of the render realistically. Also, Enable the subpixel mapping function. I often enable this function as it removes artifacts such as white dots in the render. However, 
you can disable it if necessary. Let's adjust the studio flow further by moving it and increasing the extrusion amount. Back in the global DMC parameters, the noise threshold values should always be lower than the progressive image sampler noise threshold. These two noise threshold functions allow v to switch between the minimum and the maximum values depending on the areas of the scene being rendered. As the name suggests, the noise threshold controls the noise in a renders and your overall quality. Reducing the noise threshold values increases the quality and the rendering times. Because we want the renders to be quick in drafts, let's set the global DMC minimum noise threshold to 0.009 and the maximum noise threshold value to be 0.01 in a progressive image template. Next, let's expand the global switches parameters and change it to expert mode. As mentioned earlier, because this is still a draft render, we're going to leave the adaptive values to 8. Also, to ensure camera view is always rendered, we're going to lock the view. Select the camera viewport. In the render setup dialog, click on the view to render padlock button. Next, open the material editor. Select the studio flow in the viewport. Rename the material slot as base. Next, Let's load V-Ray material by clicking on this standard toggle. In the Material Map Browser dialog, expand the V-Ray rollout parameters and choose the V-Ray material from the list. The V-Ray material is now loaded. In real life, most materials have a falloff. To emulate this effect in 3ds Max, click on the Diffuse toggle first. In the Material Map Browser dialog, expand the standard materials rollout and choose the falloff procedural map from the list. Click on the black color swatch and change it to a darker white tone in a color selector dialog. Next, click on a white color swatch and change it to an off-white color in a color selector dialog. Click on the Go to Parent button and go back to the basic parameters. Click on the Assign button to assign it to the object. For the car object, select in the viewport. In the Material Editor, to create a new material, Simply select the first material slot. Drag and drop it to a new slot and rename it as Car Paint and assign it. This is obviously just the base material to start with. The following step is to start adding lights in the scene. Minima has both dialog boxes. In studio car shots such as this, users often start with the long soft lights on top. To emulate this, let's start by going to the Create panel. Select on the Lights button. Click on the photometric drop down list and choose V ray. Next, click on V ray light. In top viewport, click and drag to create it. The soft light size is often around the width of the car. Move it forward slightly and up. To change its dimensions, open the modifier panel. In its length value, let's reduce it slightly to almost fit around the length of the car. Also, adjust the width value slightly and move the light in the viewport. In a color swatch, let's leave it as it is for the time being. In a multiplier value, increase it to about 60 for now. Next, expand the options rollout and enable the invisible option. This option makes the selected light invisible to the camera when rendering. Keep the remaining options such as Effect Diffuse, Effect Specular, Effect Reflections enabled. Also, rename this light as Underscore Softbox. The next step is to open Environment and Effects dialog by pressing 8 on your keyboard. By default, the physical camera exposure is loaded. Click on it to choose V-Ray Exposure Control from the list. In the Camera Viewport, click on a Realistic Text and change it to shaded instead. Click render to check the changes made so far. This is what the render is looking like so far. Minimize these dialog boxes and bring up the photo reference. In most studio lighting shots, you often have the soft light on top and the floodlights around the subject to highlight specific details. Let's reduce the length and width values of the soft light a bit further and adjust it. 
create the first floodlight, click on the view real light button and click and drag to create it in the viewport. Floodlights are often placed just above the car. To measure the height, click on the Help Us button and select Tape button. Click and drag it to create it. The height of the floodlights should be between 1.7 or 1.8 meters. However, you can place it a bit higher or lower if you prefer. Next, let's rename this light as underscore floodlight. Open the modifier panel and adjust its width and length value and rotate it. To snap and rotate to a specific angle like 45 degrees, simply click Angle Snap Toggle toolbar. To check its settings, simply right click on a toggle to bring up the dialog and check each tab. As you can see, it's currently snapping to a rotation of every 5 degrees. And close the dialog once you're happy. Rotate the floodlight 90 degrees. Select and move it to the right slightly. To copy this floodlight, hold down the shift key and move it. The clone options dialog should pop up. Choose to instance it. Instance lights are a lot faster to render than copies. Lights that are copied as opposed to instances are processed individually as opposed to groups, which take longer to compute. All those instance lights were never possible. Click OK to close the dialog. Even when lights are instanced, you can still change their dimensions individually by clicking the scale toolbar and scaling it individually if necessary. While the modified panels are still selected, increase its multiplier value to about 55. Under Units, let's change to Radiant Power Type and change it to 55. This unit and multiplier value was chosen in accordance with what's normally used with these types of lights. Let's copy instance another light and adjust it slightly. Copy instance few more lights along the other side of the car. Let's do another test render to see what scene is looking like. The render is taking a bit of time. Let's stop it and open the render setup dialog. Open the GI tab. The primary engine is currently set to brute force. First, bring in the expert settings by clicking twice on the default button. Click on the brute force and choose the radiance map from the drop down list. And leave the light cache as it is. Also, to add connecting shadows in more detail to the car, enable the ambient occlusion function. This will bake the ambient occlusion into the render. Let's start by setting up the ambient occlusion to about 0.7 here. The radius value is often set to around 300 millimeters or 0.3 meters. Leave the subdivision values to 8 for the time being, as these are still draft renders. Under the radiance map rollout, let's choose the current preset to low. Enable the export mode by clicking twice again. Enable the show direct light function. This function allows users to preview the direction of the light and shadows during the pre-calculation process before the render starts. Next, scroll down and open the light cache parameters. Leave the default value of a thousand subdivisions. The floodlights are currently visible in the render. To make them invisible, in the options parameters enable the invisible function. This light being an instance, it will affect all the other instance floodlights in the scene. Leave the remaining options as they currently are and let's do another test render. The render is much quicker now and the floodlights are not visible in the render. Let's cancel it now. While rendering, it's often helpful to visualize how V-Ray is translating the render. V-Ray sample ray element is quite helpful to help visualize this process. To do this, open the render element tab.
Click Art and choose the Vera Sample Right Render Element from the list. Through R, G and B colors, the Sample Right will help you visualize how Vera is coping with the render. Ideally, you'd want the sample colors to be mostly blue and perhaps green, but not red. Red sample colors represent difficult areas of the render. In some cases, you can rectify this by changing the glossy samples, light samples and or the rendering settings. Let's do another test render to visualize the sample rate. Once the render starts, you can click on the render elements display roller to check each render element on the list. Now that the render is finished, you can see that most of the sample rate colors are blue, slightly green and red around the edges which is great, it's a clean render. Change the render display to RGB as before. Let's go back to the V-Ray tab and change the image sampler type to bucket and do another test render. I personally prefer to use the bucket image sampler type as it's easier to use with multiple machines, check bucket samples and set the render quality. However, feel free to use whatever you feel more comfortable with. Expand the light sample rule out. As you can see, the light subdivisions light are greyed out. This is mainly because we are using the global DMC parameters to compute both the lights and the glossy material samples. Let's increase the bucket image sampler max subdivision values to 100 for universal workflow. If we were to enable the use local subdivisions function, the samples of the lights and glossy material subdivisions would become available. Any glossy artifacts would require tweaking individually as opposed to globally. However, the rendering times would have increased dramatically. As mentioned earlier, disabling this function grays out the lights and the glossy material subdivision samples, as these values will be dealt with via global DMC. The following step is to begin adding materials to the car. Before we do so, select the car. Go to the Group Toolbar and open it. Select the roof of the car. Let's organize these floating dialogues a bit. While the car paint material is still selected, click on the V-Ray material toggle. In the Material Map Browser dialog, under V-Ray Rollout Parameters, choose the V-Ray car paint material from the list and begin assigning it to the red parts of the car. Let's move some of these dialog boxes out of the way a bit. In the top viewport, rotate and zoom in closer to the car and continue assigning the V-Ray car paint material to the remaining red parts of the car. Minimize the material editor. Select the camera viewport and maximize it. Let's do another test render to see what the V-Ray car paint material is looking like. While rendering and checking the passes, you can also enable the track mouse while rendering by clicking on this button. The bucket renderings will actually follow your mouse as they finish rendering each area. This is one of the many reasons I prefer bucket renderings over progressive type. The following step is to change the V-Ray car paint material to match closely to the photo reference. Open the material editor again. Click on the base color swatch and pick the red hue in a color selector dialog. Change the value to about 86, the green value to 2, the blue value to 2 and OK to close the dialog. Alternatively, you could simply click on a sample screen color and select it from the photo reference. The following step is to change the flake layer parameters. Right click and copy the red color swatch. In the flake color swatch, right click and paste it. Select the flake color swatch and change its color to white. This will make the flake color more apparent. As a precautionary measure, 
avoid tweaking with the flake glossiness values as it might cause artifacts. Next, let's increase the flake size to 1.0 to make it more apparent in render. Let's do another test render to check the changes. The car paint material is looking reasonable now. The following step is to move some of the floodlights so the reflections are not in the middle of the car. To do so, extend the viewport and restrict the selections to lights only by clicking and selecting it from the list. In the top viewport, hold down the control key and select all the floodlights on the left. Move them to the left slightly. Let's repeat the same action for the floodlights on the right. Also, rotate them slightly so they beam towards the car. Let's do another test render to check the changes. Some of the floodlight reflections are still visible in the middle of the car. Let's cancel the render. Before we move the floodlights further, let's ensure the reflections are not too sharp. Minimize and close some of the dialogs. To soften the edges of the floodlights being reflected, we are going to use the V-Ray softbox shader. While one of the floodlights are selected, open the Modify panel and click on its toggle under Texture. In the Material Map Browser dialog, scroll down. Under V-Ray Rollout Parameters, choose the V-Ray softbox shader from the list. Next, open the Material Editor and drag and drop the shader into the new material slot. Choose the Instance method. To soften the edges of the corner, scroll down and enable the frame group. To begin softening the edges, slide this point to the left. Slide it even further to soften the edges even more. Let's do another test render to check the changes. As you can see, the edges are now looking softer. The render is looking clean. Move the floodlights further away and rotate them towards the car. Let's do another quick test render. As you can see, the overall refractions are looking much better without the floodlights refractions in the middle. As we zoom in closer, the car paint flakes seem a bit too apparent. To rectify this, open the material editor. Go to the car paint material and change the flake scale value to 1.0. To do a region render, click on this button and draw around the area you want to region render. Click render. As you can see, the flakes are not, are not as prominent. Always remember to uncheck the region button before sending the final render. The next material we are going to work on is the glass material. Select the front glass of the car. Select a new material slot. Rename it as glass. As previously done, click on the standard toggle and choose the V-Ray material from the list. First, click on the diffuse color swatch and change the whiteness to black in a color selector dialog. In a refract group, change its color swatch to white to make it completely transparent. When the refract color swatch is completely black, a surface is fully opaque. When the refract color swatch is completely white, a surface is fully transparent. When dealing with refractions and refractions, it's good practice to always enable the background button. Double click on it to see a bigger preview of the material. Let's leave the refraction value as 1.6 and the effect shadows function enabled. The effect shadows function allows shadows to be cast through the transparent objects. Click on the effect channels function and choose all channels option from the list. This option allows lights to be seen through the transparency in a Vero light selected element. In a reflect group, Click on its color swatch and change it to white. When the reflect color is completely white, a surface is fully reflective. 
when the reflect color swatch is completely black, a surface is not reflected. Assign this material to the selected object in the scene. Also, assign it to all the glass objects in the scene. Let's do another test render to see the changes. The next material we're going to create is the chrome for the car rims and a plastic material for these areas. Select one of the rims in the viewport. Select a new material slot and rename it as rim and create a new V-Ray material using the same techniques shown before. Next, load up the falloff procedural map as previously done. Change the first color swatch to light grey and the second color swatch to off-white. Click on the go to parent button to go back to the main parameters. To control the specula and make it appear in a render element, we are going to disable the Fresnel function. Also, enable the background button and double click on the material slot to maximize it. To visualize the specula reflection and refractions in the render, we are going to open the render setup dialog. In the render elements tab, click add and choose the V-Ray specular render element from the list. Also, add the V-Ray raw refraction, V-Ray refraction, V-Ray refraction and the V-Ray raw refraction. Back in the material editor and check the highlight glossiness padlock to control its values independently. To control the reflectivity, click on the reflect color swatch. To make it very reflective, drag the whiteness slider to almost white. Brighter colors make a surface reflective and darker colors have the opposite effect. Scroll down to the BRDF parameters and change it from Blin to Ward. This stuff for BDRF makes surfaces look more metallic in appearance. To add a bit of sheen to the surface, decrease the highlight glossiness value to about 0.7. You can clearly see the difference this value is making to the surface in the material slot preview. In the reflect glossiness value, we are going to disperse it slightly. As you can see in the preview, the reflections are looking too linear, almost like a mirror. To disperse the reflections, simply reduce the reflect glossiness value to about 0.96. Note how the reflections are gradually changing as you reduce the reflect glossiness values. Let's assign this material slot to both rims and to another test render. As it renders, we can check each render element added. This is how the specular render element looks. If the Fresnel was turned on, you probably wouldn't have been able to see in a render element. The raw reflections element looks a bit noisy because the global DMC image sampler values are still draft for the time being. This is the raw refraction element. Refraction elements are only visible on transparent surfaces. This is the refraction element. This is the refraction element which is similar to the raw refractions. Let's cancel the render for now. The following step is to apply this material to other parts of the rim surface. Also, apply the car paint material to the car brakes disc. Repeat this action to other parts of the car. Let's use the photo reference to apply some of the current materials accordingly. The following step is to create a plastic type material to apply these other parts of the car. As previously done, select a new material slot. Click on the standard toggle and choose the V-Ray material from the list. And check the Fresnel function. Unlock the highlight glossiness. Next, click on the reflection color swatch and increase the reflectivity slightly. Click on the diffuse toggle and apply the follow-up procedural map. The front colour is going to be black and the side colour a bit off-white. 
Click and drag the front color swatch into the side one. Choose to copy it. Select the side color swatch and make it slightly brighter. Click on the Go to Parent button to go back to the main parameters. Double click on the material slot to maximize it. Let's add a bit of sheen by decreasing the highlight glossiness value slightly. Click on the background button to see the reflections. Next, let's disperse the sheen further by decreasing its value even more. And disperse the reflections by decreasing the reflection glossiness values. Because we want the plastic color to be darker, let's reduce the reflectivity slightly by making the reflect color swatch a bit darker. We can later increase the reflectivity in post with the raw refraction render element. Also, Let's make the sheen less dispersed by increasing the highlight glossiness value. Let's rename the material as plastic. Select the object in the scene and assign this material to it. Select other objects in the scene and assign this material and others accordingly. The following material to create is a tire material. This is a new material has similar properties to the properties of the plastic one. Select the tire object in the scene. In the material editor, click and drag the plastic material into a new slot and rename it as tires. Assign it to the selected tire in the scene. As you can see in the photo reference, tires have less sheen than plastic surfaces. Double click on the material slot to maximize it. To emulate this effect, let's disperse the sheen by decreasing highlight glossiness values. Go to the plastic material and tweak it slightly. Close the tires preview dialog. Zoom into tires in a viewport and assign the remaining materials accordingly. Let's save the max file and do another test render. As you can see, the render is gradually looking better. We can possibly change the glass color to a slight tone of green to look closer to the photo reference. Let's stop the render. Select the glass material. Click on its diffuse toggle and apply the follow up procedural map. Change the side color swatch to a lighter tone of green and the front color swatch to a darker tone of green. Because we haven't modeled the overall scene in great detail, the current reflections of the ceiling and the overall environment reflected on the car are not as appealing as it could be. For this reason, we're going to use a nice HRI image of a studio to affect the reflections and refractions only. For this exercise, we're not going to use a HDRI image in the environment toggle because we don't want to generate additional lighting. Let's start by opening the environment dialog by pressing A on your keyboard. Next, open the render setup dialog. In the V-Ray tab, scroll down the image filter parameters and change it to area type. I personally prefer this type of image filter, however, feel free to use any of the other ones listed. In the Environment Parameters rollout, enable the Reflection and Refraction Environment functions. As mentioned earlier, we only want to affect the reflections and refractions in the scene. To load the HDRI image, click on the Reflection toggle and choose the Viewer HDRI shader from the list. Next, to edit this shader, open the Material Editor dialog first. Drag and drop the Vera HDRI toggle from the Render Setup dialog into the new slot in the Material Editor. Choose the Instance set and rename this new material as Reflection. Click on the Bitmap toggle and choose this EXR HDRI image. 
increase the exposure value to about 5.0 to open it. In a mapping group, change the mapping to a spherical type. In a processing group, increase your raw multiplier to 30 and the render multiplier to 30 as well. Back in a render setup dialog, let's copy instance refraction toggle into the refraction. Let's do another test render to check the latest changes. As you can see, the reflections in the car are looking much better now. This HDRI image was found in cgtextures.com. In the website, simply click on HDRI panorama section here. Scroll down to find the preferred HDRI images. This is the one that was chosen. Here, you have the preview of its effects on reflections, lighting and etc. On this side, you have the JPEGs and on the other side, you have the HDRIs. The JPEGs are often used for display purposes in a viewport or environment. And the HDRIs are for global illumination and reflections. As you can see, the reflection and refractions are looking a lot better now. The following step is to apply the car number plate material using some of the techniques highlighted earlier. Select a new material slot. Click on the standard shader and choose the view ray material from the list. Deselect the Fresnel function. In BRDF parameters, change it to a metal finish by choosing wood from the list. Scroll back up. Deselect the highlight glossiness padlock and click on reflect color swatch. Increase the reflectivity by moving down the whiteness slider towards the slightly brighter tone. To add a bit of sheen, decrease the highlight glossiness value slightly. Also, diffuse the reflections by decreasing the reflect glossiness value slightly. Double click on the material slot to maximize it and enable the background button. Let's tweak the value a bit further to make the surface more reflective and diffuse and with smaller highlights. Click on the reflect color swatch and increase the reflectivity a bit. Diffuse the reflections by decreasing the reflect glossiness values. And reduce the highlight size by increasing the highlight glossiness values. To add a car number plate texture, simply click on diffuse toggle and choose the bitmap. Enable the show shader material in the viewport. Click on the view image toggle to check the texture. As you can see, the texture is not very high in resolution. To make the texture look a bit sharp in render, simply decrease the blur values. It's worth noting that reducing the blur value will increase the rendering times of this texture slightly. Because this texture covers a very small part of the scene, it won't affect the rendering times much. Click on the go to parent button to go back to the main parameters. Let's spread the sheen by decreasing the highlight glossiness. Next, to add a bit of bump to the surface, let's copy the diffuse toggle texture by right clicking on it and choosing to copy. Scroll down and expand the maps rollout. In a bump toggle, right click and choose to paste it. Also, reduce the bump value to around 7.0 and do a region render around the car number plate. Let's rename this material as car plate. Select the object in the viewport and enable the UEW map modifier. Click on the isolation button to isolate the object. There's already a UVW map modifier applied to it. To show how this was applied, let's delete it first by clicking on the Remove Modifier button. Click on this button and choose the UVW map modifier from the list. Once loaded, choose the box mapping type. Enable the UVW map modifier by clicking on it to turn blue. Now that that's enabled, use the Move tool to move the UVW gizmo seen in yellow. You can adjust it further by rotating it and clicking on the Fit button. The following step is to assign the material to the car plate object in the scene. Turn the shaded viewport to wireframe before exiting the isolation mode. Close the material preview dialog. The next material we're going to create is the floor based material.
most studio floors have a plain colour. However, for the purpose of this exercise, we are going to make it a bit more interesting by adding complex procedural maps, textures and effects. Select the studio floor in the viewport. Back in the material editor, select the base material slot. In a follow up procedural map, click on this front toggle and choose the color correction procedural map. Let's rename this color correction material as dark, as this is where the darker material will be. Click on the go to parent button to go back to the main follow up parameters. Drag and drop this color correction material into the side toggle and choose to copy it. Go inside this new color correction material and name it as bright. To apply textures, go back into the dark material slot. Click on the map toggle. In the Material Map Browser dialog, click Bitmap and choose the texture named Concrete Floor Finish, seen in here. Again, this texture is extremely high resolution and came from cgtextures.com. Once loaded, click on the Show Shaded Material in the viewport. Next, as previously done, open the Modifier panel. Apply the UVW Map modifier and choose the Box Mapping Type. Also, click on Fit button to fit the texture. To tell the texture, type in 3.0M, which is for meters. Type it in for length, width and height. Back in the material editor, go back to the color correction basic parameters. Right click and copy the texture. Go back to the main follow off parameters and paste instance the texture into the map toggle. Now we have both textures linked to one another while the color correction parameters are not. Go back to the main follow off parameters and inside a dark color correction. Inside each texture, if you were to change any of these parameters, you would automatically affect other instance textures. Back into the dark color correction parameters, we are going to make the overall color a bit darker and desaturated. Let's start by sliding the texture value to minus 100 to completely desaturate the texture. Double click on the material slot to maximize the preview. Next, under lightness, slide the brightness value to the left to about minus 20. Back in the follow up parameters, click inside the bright toggle. As previously done, desaturate the texture color by sliding the saturation value to minus 100. Under lightness, slide the brightness value to the right to about 10. Double click on the material slot to preview the fall off. Now you can clearly see the fall off between the darker and brighter material. Previously, the fall off was only between these two colors. Now it's between both color corrections with the texture. Let's go back to the main V ray parameters. Double click on the material slot again to maximize it. Next, disable the Fresnel Reflections function and unlock the high glossiness padlock. Click on the Reflect color. Let's organize some of these dialogs. Increase the reflectivity by sliding the whiteness value towards white. Reduce the highlight glossiness value slightly to add a bit more sheen to the surface. To lower the value, the blurrier the sheen will look, as you can see here. To also blur the reflections, let's reduce the reflection glossiness value slightly. Enable the background button to visualize a reflection in a preview dialog. Reduce its value further to about 0.7 to blur the reflections even more. To add a little bump or displacement, we are going to create a grayscale texture. Let's start by clicking on the diffuse toggle to find its texture. Locate and choose to open it in Photoshop. First, click on the Adjustment Layer button and choose R, the Hue and Saturation from the list. Desaturate the color completely by sliding it to minus 100. Next, click R, the Levels Adjustment Layer. To start adjusting the contrast, select Move the Middle Slider further to the left side. Add the rightmost slider slightly to the far left. Select the Middle Slider again and move it to the right. We are now beginning to get a lot more contrast on the texture. Adjust the sliders further until there is enough contrast on a black and white texture. Click the zoom tool and zoom into the texture to see the transition between colors. 
adjust the contrast further to see the darker areas in the texture. Once happy, click on File and choose to save the texture as JPEG file format from the list. Name it as underscore bump. Also, it's worth saving this document as a PSD file format in case you might want to revisit this file to make further changes to the adjustment layers. Close this dialog and go back to the main material parameters. Scroll to the maps ruler and expand it. Click on a bump toggle and choose the bitmap procedural map. In a bitmap dialog, pick the bump texture from the list. Once loaded, note how the surface changed immediately in the material preview. Go back to the main parameters and reduce the bump values to about 7.0. There's now a more subtle bump on the surface seen in the material preview. Scroll back up. In real life, most surfaces reflect light unevenly. To reproduce this effect on our CG surface, we are going to plug grayscale textures into the reflection, highlight glossiness, and reflect glossiness toggles. Let's start by clicking on the reflect toggle and choosing the bitmap from the list. Choose one of the textures named underscore gloss. This grayscale texture was created in a similar way to the bump texture. This texture variation has less contrast than the bump texture as it works best for reflections and glossiness effects. As you can see, there are white areas, but the darker areas are not totally black. This will create a gradual disturbance or unevenness on reflections or and glossiness. Click open to load the texture. You can clearly see how the reflections have changed once the new grayscale texture was loaded. The following step is to add a color correction map to control the contrast of the textures and reflectivity. Click on the Go to Parent button and click inside the Reflect toggle. Add a color correction map as previously done. Choose to keep the old map as submap. Scroll down to the lightness parameters and change the brightness to 20 and the contrast to 12. Go back to the main parameters. Copy the Reflect toggle into the Highlight Glossiness toggle by dragging and dropping it. Choose the Copy option and OK to close the dialog. Note how the Highlight Glossiness has changed. It's now more uneven. Go inside its toggle, scroll down. In the Lightness parameters, adjust the Brightness and Contrast values and go back to the main parameters. Drag and drop the Reflect toggle into the Reflect Glossiness. Go inside the toggle. In the lightness parameters, we're going to blur the reflections unevenly by first changing the brightness value to about minus 14. Go back to the main parameters. Scroll down to the maps rollout. By default, V-Ray is using 100% for what's inside color correction toggle. If this toggle was empty, you'll be using the color swatch or a parameter value. Let's reduce it from 100% to 10%. V-Ray is now mixing both the Reflect Color Swatch with its Color Correction Toggle. V-Ray is using 10% of the Color Correction Toggle and 90% of the Color Swatch, as seen in the Material Preview changes. In Highlight Glossiness, let's reduce its value to 35%. The surface is now looking a lot more appealing, as you can see in the Material Preview. Only 35% of the color correction map is being used. The remaining values are being ex extracted from the highlight glossiness values seen in here. So both parameters are being mixed. In the refraction glossiness there, let's reduce it to about 73%. As you can see, tweaking these values have made a huge positive difference on the overall look at the surface. Next, let's close the dialog and do another test render to see what's looking like. As you can see, the region render is still there. Let's stop it, disable the region and do another test render. Because it's starting to take a bit of time to render, let's stop it again. Draw a region around the floor area and do another test render. As you can see, the floor is looking quite good. However, it's not looking as realistic as it could be. 
To make it even more realistic, let's stop the render in our displacement modifier. To do so, open the material editor first. Open the modifier panel and add the viewer displacement modifier from the list. By default, the displacement type is set to 3D mapping. To speed up the renders, let's choose a 2D mapping instead. Next, drag the BAMP JPEG from the material editor and drag it into the text map toggle. Choose the instance method. The V-Ray displacement modifier works best with grayscale textures. Next, let's set the amount to 2 mm. To do so, simply type in 2 mm. Even though the display unit sign meters, by typing in mm after a value, 3ds Max will enter the values in millimeters. 2 mm will add enough details to the floor and make it a lot more realistic. Let's do another quick test render to see the changes. Just by zooming in closely, you can clearly see how much better the floor is now looking. Now that we are happy with the floor, let's cancel the render. The following step is to add smudges and footsteps on the floor as seen here in the photo reference. This will help make the scene even more realistic. To do so, in the Material Editor dialog, click on the V-Ray Material toggle and choose the V-Ray Blend Material from the list. Choose the option to keep all material as submaterial. The original material has now become the base material as you can see here. To create the smudge material, drag and drop the base material into the first sculpt material toggle. Choose the copy option and OK to close the dialog. Go inside coat 1 toggle and rename it as dust. Next, we're going to use a grayscale texture in a blend amount toggle to separate between the base and dust material. Click on the first blend toggle and choose the bitmap procedural map. Choose this smudge texture. This is the smudge texture we're going to use. This texture was originally downloaded from polygon.com website. It's a free texture and can easily be found by googling polygon textures. Once you enter the website, you'll see a huge library of textures. The one I'm using is under Grunge. The majority of them are for purchase and few of them are free. That's why I found this texture. Click open to load it. Click on show shaded material in the viewport. Minimize frame buffer. As you can see, that's the smudge texture being used. Click on the go to parent button. The dust material shouldn't have all these reflections and glossy seen in the base material. Also, the color of the dust is slightly different. Click on the go to parent button and go inside the dust material. Click on this diffuse color swatch and change it to a slight tone of green. To be precise, you can type in the value of 59 for the red color, 59 for green, 49 for blue, 43 for hue, 43 for saturation and 59 for value. Because you want the color to be seen a bit more, let's scroll down to the maps rollout and reduce the diffuse value to about 88%. Double click on the material slot to maximize the preview. Next, reduce the highlight glossiness value to 15 and the reflection glossiness to 15. Scroll up and reduce the reflect color swatch to zero. The dust material shouldn't have any reflections. Also, change the highlight glossiness value to 1. If you look closely in the material, you can actually see parts of the grunge material being used as masks between both the base and the dust material. So this dust color is mixed with the base material. Click on Go to Parent button to go back to the main parameters. Next, we are going to reduce the tiling scene on the back wall. To do so, let's start by closing all the open dialog boxes. Select the base floor and maximize the left viewport. Press Ctrl V in the keyboard and copy it. Choose the Copy Clone option and OK to close it. While the copied floor is still selected, go to the modifier and enable the edit spine by clicking it on the stack. Enable the vertex mode by pressing 1 on your keyboard or selecting it. And select the two vertices on the top left. 
press delete on your keyboard, zoom into the two vertices at the end, select both vertices, right click and convert them to corner type to straighten the corners. Next, exit the modifier panel and select other full surface called base. Open the modifier panel and enable the edit spline modifier as before. In the viewport, select the last two vertices at the end. In the modify panel, click on the refine button and add two vertices, one on top and another one at the bottom. Back in the modify panel, enable the segment section or press 3 on your keyboard. Select the front section of the base surface and delete it. Next, select and zoom into the deleted section. Enable the vertex selection and click on the connect button. Click on the first vertex and the second one to connect both ends. Enable the snap tool by pressing N on your keyboard. Select the top vertex, right click and convert it into a corner type as before. Select the bottom vertex and snap it onto the top one. Exit the modifier panel and select the other full surface. Open the modifier panel and enable the edit spline. Select both vertices and move them as close as possible to the other surface next to it. Once satisfied, exit the modify panel. Also, let's adjust the pivot point by enabling the effect pivot point only and moving it to the base of the floor. Once adjusted, exit and go to the create panel. Expand the viewport. As mentioned earlier, the texture on the foreground looks good, but the back wall looks a bit tiled. Now that we have two separate surfaces, we can quickly fix this problem. First, open the material editor. Drag and drop this material to copy and create a new material slot. Next, drag and drop the base material into the main V-Ray band material to replace it with the standard V-Ray one. Choose to copy and OK to close the dialog. Now we have a standard V-Ray material without the grunge mask styling at the back. Select the back wall in the viewport and assign the new material to it. Go inside its diffuse toggle and enable its texture in the viewport. As you can see, the grunge is only applied to the foreground surface now. Go back to the main parameters and save the 3ds Max file. Next, maximize the viewport. The front wheel of the car was rotated slightly to make the shot a bit more dramatic. Let's do a quick test run there to see some of the changes made to the floor. As you can see, the floor now has a lot more details. Let's stop the render and bring in the photo reference. As you can see, the render is now looking a lot closer to the photo reference. We could easily adjust the colors using some of the techniques described earlier. However, it's quicker and better to do it in post-production. Next, we are going to start by adding crucial render elements for post-production. First, let's ungroup the car object by clicking on the group main toolbar and choosing to open it. Now you can select parts of the car individually. Open the render elements tab. We are going to start with the V-Ray Multimat render element. To add the V-Ray Multimat element, simply click on the add button and choose it from the dialog. V-Ray Multimat works with three colors mainly. R, G and B colors. R is for red. G is for green and B is for blue. Each color is represented by a number. In this case, it's 1, 2 and 3. Once rendered, the Vero Multimap Render element will look similar to this example. For instance, if you wanted the car paint material to have the red Multimap channel, you would need to select all objects with that material in the scene, right click on it and choose the Object Properties option. In the G-Buffer group, Type in the number associated with any of the three colors in a, in a multimat element. As mentioned earlier, whatever color is typed in, it needs to be corresponding to any of the numbers entered there in a multimat element. So, for instance, if you want a disk glass object to have the green multimat channel, you'd need to select a right click on a glass object, choose the object properties option, and type in the gbuffer ID number. That's how you would add a multimat element and their associated numbers. 
every multi-map element has the numbers 1, 2 and 3 by default. If you plan to add many multi-map elements, you'd need to name each render element differently. For instance, the first multi-map element would be named multi-map element 1. For the second multi-map element, you'd simply click and choose the multi-map element from the list again and rename it as multi-map element 2. If the previous multi-map element had the numbers 1, 2 and 3, the second render element needs to have a different set of numbers such as 4, 5, 6 for the R, G and B. This second multi-map element could be applied to some of the rim objects. Simply go to the group toolbar and open the group, followed by selecting and numbering the objects accordingly. The same steps will apply to every object in the scene. In the end, you'll end up with multiple multi-map render elements. With each multi-map element covering three objects in R, G and B colors. Multi-map element colors are true representation of R, G and B channels, which are a lot more accurate than the standard Vero wire color element, especially when selecting elements in post. This topic will be covered in more detail in post-production section. The next render element to add is the Vero light select element. This render element is extremely useful to make renders more realistic in post-production, especially as it allows users to mix lights individually in post. When added accordingly, the render element should look similar to this render. To add a viewer light select element, click Add and choose the viewer light select element from the list. To name the element accordingly, first select one of the lights in the scene. Select its name, right-click and copy it and paste it in a Vero Light Select element name. Next, click Guard and select a light. Once rendered, it should look exactly like one of the renders shown earlier. Vero Light Select element works best with one light per element, as opposed to multiple lights. For better control of each light in the scene, you should have one light per Vero Light Select element. When you have numerous lights in the scene, the process of adding each light individually might become a bit laborious. To expedite this process, there's a script called Auto Review Light Select. For more information on where to find and download this free script, simply watch my other tutorial here. Once installed, simply click on Auto Review Light Select button here. The dialog should pop up. By default, it's set to all lights in the scene. However, there are other options such as current selection and so on. As one element is an example where you add all lights into one render element. This is obviously a no-go option. Leave the default options as they currently are and click on the create elements button. As you can see, each V-Ray light select render element was added and named according to the name of the light objects being used. This is one of the reasons why it's important to name objects accordingly when creating them. Close its dialog. The following step is to tweak the final parameters for high resolution renders. To do so, let's start by opening the common tab first. Increase the output size by 3500 pixels by 3500 pixels. We could obviously increase the render size. However, for the purpose of this exercise, 3500 by 3500 pixels is big enough for high resolution prints. Next, open the V-Ray tab. Under Frame Buffer Rollout, enable the V-Ray Raw image file. Click on its toggle. Enabling this function allows V-Ray to save the image in its raw format. Rename it as Tesla Studio Lighting. The default file type is a V-Ray image file. However, you can also enable the EXR option, Deep EXR and Dot Delimited Frame Buffer. When rendered, the file type will look similar to this one here. If per chance your file crashes while rendering, the frame buffer will be automatically saved into the V-Ray RAW image file. Please check my other tutorial on how to open RAW image file in V-Ray frame buffer. Next, enable the resumable rendering option. This function should only be enabled before sending the final renders. When enabled, you can stop the render before it's finished, close the VS Max and restart the following day if desired. V-Ray will continue or resume the render from where it was last stopped. However, the pre-calculation will be recomputed. 
Also, if the render crashes, you'll be able to continue from where the last render was stopped. When you finish rendering, you should always disable this function. Enable the separate render channels function to render the element separately. Next, to name your main render, click on this toggle here. Name the file as Tester Lighting Studio and choose the file format to be a TIFF from the list. TIFF image file formats are best for high resolution renders. Click Save. In the TIFF image control dialog, enable the 16 bit color option, not compression, and 300 dots per inch. Scroll down to the global switches and increase the adaptive lights value to about 16 for better light computation. Next, scroll down to the image sampler rollout. The minimum shading rate helps to increase the quality of the render effects such as grain, glossiness and area shadows without affecting the rendering times. Increase it to about 32 for good measure. In bucket image sampler, increase the max subdivisions to about 100 to be coherent with the universal workflow. In the noise threshold, let's set it to about 0 0.007. As mentioned earlier, this is the maximum value V will go up to. In a global DMC rollout, decrease the noise threshold to 0 0.004. This is the minimum value V will go down to. The smaller the value, the less noise there will be in the render. As mentioned earlier, the noise threshold value should always be lower than the noise threshold of the bucket image sampler. Next, open the GI tab. In the ambient occlusion group, increase the subdivisions to about 24 to make the effect smoother and less grainy. Under the irradiance map, let's change the current preset to medium. Medium preset is enough for most scenes. The remaining settings are okay as they are. Next, open the Render Elements tab and add the Vero Z depth from the list. To work out the Vero Z depth distance, I often use a tape tool to measure from where the camera is positioned to where I want the Vero Z depth map to extend to. Next, I would simply type in the value seen here in a view and ZDEV max value. It doesn't necessarily need to be that exact value for a good starting point. The ZDEV element is quite useful to create effects such as depth of field and a fog effect in a background. This is an example of what a ZDEV element looks like in a render. As you can see, it extends all the way to the back tires. However, you could make it a bit shorter by reducing the max value. We could also add other render elements such as raw global illumination, diffuse filter, denoiser, global illumination, V-ray normals, raw shadows, self-illumination, total lighting and wire color. Finally, let's do one final check and ensure everything is set accordingly. And click render. The final render should look similar to this file here. These are the dust bits we've created earlier. While I personally prefer to do color corrections and adjustments in post, some users prefer to use the LUT files directly in 3ds Max. LUT stands for Lookup Table, and it provides a final preview of what the desired outcome will be after using curves and color correction in post-production. You can create LUT files in Photoshop by clicking File, Export, Color Lookup Tables, choose your settings and save. To load LUT files, Simply enable the Show Corrections control and scroll down to the LUT section. Click to open its rollout and enable it. Next, click on the Load toggle and load up any of the pre-saved LUT files. There are cases when it might be a bit overblown. To correct this, 
simply disable the option to convert to log space before applying LUT. Turn the LUT on and off to see the before and after effects. Also, you can use some of the V-Ray frame buffer correction controls, so adjust the LUT. You can experiment with your own LUT files or download amazing ones on 3D Collective website. There, you can find the free and professional LUT files. Once downloaded, you can pick and choose the ones you like best from their vast library of LUT files. The next course will take users through the post-production process of transforming this raw render into this final one in minutes. To watch the second part about post-production and to download all project files, please click the links below. I really hope you've enjoyed this course, like and share it.